7.30 to 7.40. So that means that I've got to pick up the pace. And <laughs> I think we took about 40, 45 minutes this afternoon. I uh, had a good turnout this afternoon to look at the Word. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 40. Uh, believe it or not, this is our final, our final message in the book of Exodus. It has been, uh, uh, for me, it's a little bittersweet. <laughs> Just... Um, uh, been, uh, I, I've, I feel like the Lord has really worked in my heart through the book, and I trust through yours as well. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm excited uh, to kind of conclude this journey, but at the same time, it's a little, it's a little sad to kind of say goodbye to it. So um, let's, uh, let's just pray before we get into the Word, and we'll get, we'll get started here. Lord, we are so thankful for your Word and the privilege we have of gathering together and, and hearing uh, receiving what you have for us, and I pray, Father, that you would be with me now. Uh, Lord, as we, we sing sometimes so often, Lord, I need you every hour. Nothing could be more true as we come to the proclamation of your word tonight. Uh, although I'm inadequate for it, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in and through me. Uh, your word and your spirit are enough, and so we ask that you would accomplish your purpose in this place tonight. We ask in Jesus' name, and amen. When we left off last week, we saw the people, uh, the people of God excited about the work of God. And, and they, they rallied to, together to accomplish the task that God had given them. And so truly, an exciting time. The people came together. They used their time. They used their talents. They used their treasure. And by doing that, uh, they accomplished the mission that God had given them. And, and so we see that everything comes together in, in chapter 35 through 39. So when we come to the final chapter, really the question is, what's next? They complete the work on the tabernacle. They have everything ready. And so that's what we come to here in chapter 40. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to work through very quickly the the first several verses. We're just going to look at a few of them because a lot of it is detail we've already looked at concerning the tabernacle. So starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And then down in verse 16, this Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. And then down in verse 33, and he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court, so Moses finished the work. So the answer is, what's next is it's time to put this thing together. Um, We get a little bit of a time frame. It's been about a year since they were set free from Egypt. So (laughs) what a year it has been. If you, you know, we're kind of in that point in time where we look back on the previous year. We're looking ahead to the, but can you imagine what it would have been like to be the Israelites and looking back on the past year? I mean, they experienced the miraculous deliverance of God out of Egypt. They had walked through the Red Sea, saw that same sea swallow up the Egyptian army. Um, they, they experienced God's miraculous provision as they worked their way through the desert. Uh, you, just, you think about everything that they saw. What an incredible time it would have been for them now to look back and to see. You know, they... they they encountered God on Mount Sinai, the smoke and the, the fire. And you know, there's also some times of tragedy and judgment and certainly God's grace as they look back over this, this year. But now, as this year comes to a conclusion, they have everything they need to worship God. They have the tabernacle that God has instituted for them to put together. And so that's complete And one of the things that stands out when you're walking through these last few chapters of the book of Exodus, it says they did everything that God commanded. Over and over again. All that God commanded, this they did. And, I mean, do you think they learned their lesson? At least for now, right? At least for now, they have grabbed a hold of this truth that obedience is essential to their walk with the Lord. And, in fact, Faith and obedience are tied so closely together. And here, they have the instruction of God, and there's no way in which they're going to deviate from that. And so, in obedience to God, they, they assemble 
the tabernacle and what happens next, I believe, alludes to one of the primary points of the book. Notice verse 34. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord. Right? So, tabernacles complete, and immediately this cloud comes and envelops the tabernacle, and it says the glory of God fills it up. Now, let me ask you this. What does that cloud represent? You remember? It's not the first time they've seen it, right? It's, it represents the presence of the Lord, right? <coughs> Back in Acts chapter 12 and 13, God led them by a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. In chapter 19, that cloud covers the mountain on Mount Sinai, and there's the warning, don't cross this line or you will die, right? The presence of God is, is signified by this cloud enveloping the tabernacle. And, and I say this is one of the primary points of the book because if you remember, the book of Exodus starts out and it seems as if God is absent, right? There's a new Pharaoh who doesn't remember Joseph, doesn't remember his family, and <laughs> things, are, things are not looking good for God's people, right? They're, they're enslaved, and not only are they enslaved, they're enslaved for a really long time time 400 years and so then (laughs) it's not until the end of chapter 2 that we're told that God sees God hears and God knows so it seems as if God is absent he's not right he's still in control his plan is still being worked out sovereignly but by all appearances it seems as if he's not there And then we begin to see glimpses of the presence of God. In chapter 3, the burning bush. Chapter 19, on Mount Sinai. And now here, at the end of the book, we have the unmistakable presence of God filling the tabernacle. And this is a major part of the biblical narrative. Go back to, to the first few chapters in Genesis. Right? God creates man in his image, in his likeness, places them in the Garden of Eden. And while in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve experience perfect fellowship with God. Right? Intimate fellowship with God. In chapter 3, we're told that God walks in the garden with them. Right? So there's this uninterrupted fellowship that they have that is not affected by sin in any way. But then in chapter 3, sin enters into creation and there's a barrier that comes between man and God because of that sin, right? And so what we see from chapter 3 onward is God moving in different ways to, res- to restore fellowship with his people. And that's what we have here with the tabernacle, right? They do this, they, they, they obey God, they put it in a, and God, he enters the tabernacle, right? The holy of holies is there. And God's presence is among his people, which is exactly what he promised. I will be your God. You will be my people. And so we have this incredible promise later fulfilled in the temple where there's a permanent structure put in place where God will dwell among his people, part of the the Davidic covenant. And even when you you jump to the New Testament and you, you hear the words, Emmanuel. God with us, right? So we see God continuing the narrative where Jesus leaves the glories of heaven, comes to earth, the perfect representation of God, and he does everything possible to restore that fellowship. And then we have the church in the New Testament, right? The birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes upon the people of God, and now the people of God experience God's presence in a, in a new way, a way that really God's people haven't experienced a permanent indwelling. And when you come to the very final, next to the last chapter in the book of Revelation, verses 3 and 4, it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. So at the very conclusion of it all, 
God is dwelling with his people. Everything is restored. Right? Back to the way it was intended to be from the outset. Uninterrupted fellowship with God. In fact, I would say this. God's presence is the point of Christianity. <laughs> it's the point. Right? We Without Christ, we are separated from God. The absence of God's presence is death and hell, right? So the presence of God is the whole point. And what stands out to me when I'm reading this is just the immediacy of his presence. As soon as the tabernacle is complete, without pause, God fills the sanctuary and covers, envelops, right, this tabernacle with his cloud. And so what we have here is a picture of a God who is who is eager to dwell among his people, right? He desires to live in fellowship with his people. I don't know if you see that in the scripture, but often we see God inviting, right? Come, 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 seek me, seek me. We have a God who wants us to enjoy his presence. He he desires that. And, And I wonder tonight how that might fit in with your, with your concept of God. Many times, people, people think of God as it's kind of this angry deity, right? He, yes, he loves us. Yes, he saved me, but he doesn't really want to spend time with me. He doesn't want to be with me. Right? He couldn't, right? But that's not what we see. What we see is a God who desires fellowship with us. You know, we just finished First John. That's one of the whole points of the book, right, is the the fellowship between God and his people. And, and, and so, you know, there's a big difference between you know, a relationship where two parties desire one another, right? And, and, and so, you know, if, if you, you know, I, I just think about the relationship between my wife and I, right? I mean, I desire her company. I look forward to it. I, I long for it, right? And she does as well. And so, you know, one of the things for us, you know, no matter what happens at the end of the day, you know, at, whatever happens throughout the day, at the end of the day, we're going to find a way to come together and spend time with one another. Right? That's important. Right? But we both desire that. We both long for that. Now, imagine just for a moment that we come to the end of the day and I look at my wife and I say, I'm sorry, hon, I don't have time for you. Yeah. I, I just don't have time for that. Well, you know, what, what, kind of, what kind of relationship would that be? But many times, that's what we do with God, do we not? God desires, he longs, he's eager to be with us, and we say, oh, I don't have time. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read the word. I don't have time to be in the, in the house of God. <laughs> God longs to be with his people. I've got to move kind of quickly here. So understand what this would have meant for the people of Israel. Right? For them, the presence of God has special meaning. Right? As soon as they see this cloud envelop the tabernacle, immediately they're going to think of two things. Number one, protection. Right? They're going to remember that it was this cloud, right? I mean, the, the enemy... The Egyptian army is pressing down on the people as they are backed in a quarter against the Red Sea. And God's cloud just, boom, plops down right between them and the Egyptian army and stops them dead. So immediately when they see this cloud and they're getting ready to enter into this new land, they're going, what? God is with me. We're safe. And then the second thing that's going to be true for them is they're going to think about direction. It's protection and direction. Because right? God faithfully led them through the wilderness day by day through that pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And so when they see that, those things, they, they, they come to their mind. And here in our passage, both of those things, they're, they're here, they're present. So let me start with protection, first of all. In verse 35, it says, Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, this is somewhat surprising, at least to me as I'm reading it. Now, on one level, it shouldn't be, right? I mean, Moses is just the builder of, 
of God's house here. And so the builder of the house doesn't get a key, and they can't just come and go whenever they want, right? This is God's house, right? God is the one who has the right, and he's the one who has the right to let people in or not. So in that sense, we can understand. But when we think about Moses, Moses has enjoyed unprecedented access to God. I mean, he's the one who, right, the burning bush, again on Mount Sinai, and again, right, God, let me see a glimpse of your glory. Okay, I'll show you as I walk by and proclaim my name. But now, Moses is not able to enter. (laughs) And you think, why? Well, I mean, why can't Moses go into the tabernacle? And we're reminded here of the holiness of God, right? Now we see the fullness of the glory of God in inhabiting the tabernacle, and God says, don't you dare come in. <laughs> From this point forward, understand, this tabernacle and later the temple, they're only going to be entered into once a year. Right? Once a year by the high priest and only for the purpose of making atonement for the sins of the high priest and for the people. Right? So, you know, this access to God from this point forward is limited. And so we see here a holy, transcendent God. Yes, he's always inviting. Yes, he wants to dwell with his people, but he is holy. <laughs> and I, I think... In particular, um, I think C.S. Lewis has a really good understanding of, of who God is. You know, if you've read the Chronicles of Narnia, he, he portrays Jesus Christ as a, as a lion. And, and, you know, they're sending these, these kids to see Aslan the lion. And the kids are going, is he safe? It's a lion, right? And the beaver's like, nobody said anything about safe, <laughs> right? But he is good. He's good. And I think that's something we have to remember. Yes, God is good. Yes, he loves, but he's not safe. He is a holy, powerful God. And so what we see here is God moving in a way in which he is protecting Moses and protecting his people by prohibiting them from coming in. (laughs) He's, He's protecting his people from himself. If they were to come into his presence, they would die because they're a sinful people, right? They're... And, and this is one of the things where, I mean, I'm reading this and I'm going, man, if Moses can't come in, then nobody can come in. I mean, if Moses can't get in, you and I have no chance, right? And, and, and so this is kind of the cliffhanger of the book because Exodus ends and you're going, that doesn't seem like an ending. And it's not really meant to be, right? Exodus is part of a larger story. It's part of the Pentateuch. And, and, and in particular here, as we come to the end, you're going, well, God is nice that you're dwelling among us, but... We can't come near you, and we can't, so what are we going to do? You're holy, we're sinful, and that's why the book of Leviticus is next. Because the book of Leviticus outlines for us the sacrificial system, and, and it's just a reminder, right? To come into the presence of this holy God requires sacrifice. If you're, you know, if I'm going to dwell in your midst, and this is going to work, then atonement is going to have to be made. And, and so that's why Leviticus falls here. Of course, all of that is fulfilled ultimately in Christ, and we'll come back to that at the end. But for now, we just understand that truth, right? God's prohibition is his protection of his people. So protection, but then direction in verse 36 and 37, throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. <laughs> so not only is God holy and transcendent, but we also see a picture of God as, as imminent. And what I mean by that is he is present. He's there, right? And, and, and so, you know, even though he's high and lifted up, and even though he's purer eyes than to behold evil, he is personally and intimately involved. And, and here, right, these people, they're following God. When the cloud goes, they go. When the cloud stops, they stop. And there's no sense in which God leads them to a place and they go, I like this place. I think we're just going to set up camp and we're going to stay here. Because right? the moment they do that, God pulls up and moves. They go, wait, wait, we got to go. Right? Or there's no sense in which you see them going, 
well, I don't really like this place much, Lord. Can we just move on? We're just going to go ahead and... No. They've come to a place where they are following God's lead every step. Every step. And, and that's significant, right? Not only for them, but for us. Right? What we see here is that, yes, they are free, but they're not free just to do whatever. They, were free. they have been set free to worship God, to follow God. And so we see the, the lordship here uh, of God as he's leading his people. They are his to command. So the cloud goes, they go. The cloud stops, they stop. And I think there's, there's at least some sense in which we think, that would be great, right? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be nice to wake up in the morning and just go, there goes the cloud. I guess this is where I'm going today. And it pops over somebody's head, and you think, well, that's who I'm supposed to talk to. And, you know, well, oh, that's who I'm supposed to marry. And, oh, that's the job I'm supposed to work at. That's the house I'm supposed to buy, right? There's the cloud. We just follow the cloud. <laughs> We kind of think, man, that would be nice, right? Just such visible evidence of where to go and what to do. But I'm not sure the people of Israel really thought that. <laughs> I'm sure there are times where the cloud landed someplace and they thought, what are we doing here? I don't really much like it here. When are we going to move on? <laughs> and and it, the, the thing with this is they had no idea. No idea when, how long. They didn't know how long they were going to be in one place. And they didn't know where God was taking them. And the truth is, it's not that different for us, right? I mean, we're, we're living, or at least we should be living, following, following the Lord's direction, following his will, being filled with his spirit, and the spirit blows where it will, <laughs> according to John 3. Right? And so we see here, you know, the people of God following the direction of God. Protection, direction, and then the last thing we see in verse 38 is, his faithfulness, his promise. It says, For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And this is good, right? God has said, I will be your God, you will be my people. I will give you this land, and I will go with you. And that's exactly what he does. <laughs> that should be in great comfort to your heart tonight. <laughs> The, the God who has said to you, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. We can cling to that promise. When he says, I will never leave you or forsake you, you can be confident in his presence. And so we have all three, right? His presence, we have his protection, we have his direction. And all of this, all of this, make no mistake, is pointing us forward to Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, this tabernacle beautifully displays God's presence among his people. It's a beautiful picture. But it's a picture that finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Jesus is the true and better tabernacle. You know, you don't have to go far into the New Testament. John chapter 1, we looked at verse a lot over this Christmas season. Right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory right that that word dwell is the very same word for tabernacle you could read it literally the word became flesh and tabernacled among us so, so what we see here is jesus christ he makes presence with god possible this fellowship that was marred by sin Jesus opens the door, right? And, and if, if we're familiar with the construction of the tabernacle, we know barring that, you know, kind of keeping people out of that holy of holies is the, the veil, right, the curtain. But in, at the end, when Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, it is finished, that curtain is torn in two from top to bottom and access is granted to God in a way that never had been before, apart from the Garden of Eden. And so then, in Hebrews chapter 4, we are told, what? We come boldly before his throne. Because Jesus has given us access. Access that we would not have apart from him. So because of that redemptive work, you and I can enjoy the presence of God right now. And Psalm 1611 says, in his presence 
is fullness of joy. Life and joy, protection and direction, all found through Jesus Christ. Let me ask you tonight, do you have the presence of God in your life? You you understand it begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because of our sin, we are separated from God. But Jesus died as a substitute for our sin. And when we receive what he offers, we receive this new fellowship with God. And he becomes Lord of our life. And we follow him, but we have restored presence in in, in a powerful way. In fact, you know, when Jesus, you know, Jesus goes to the cross, he dies, he's buried, he raises again, and he says to his disciples, I will not leave you orphans. <laughs> you know, what he says in John 14 is this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So not only do we have presence with God restored through Jesus Christ, but then we get to experience the fullness of the presence of God in his spirit. And that is something, i got to be honest, that's something I take for granted. I don't think about it nearly enough. I'm not focused on following and being filled with the spirit nearly as much as I should be. We should be desperate for this. In, in, in Psalm 51, David, this is his you know, kind of prayer of repentance in Psalm 51. But towards the end of that chapter, he says, Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. So in this prayer, he pleads with God that he would not, he would not lose fellowship, that he would not lose the presence of the Spirit of God. All that we would be desperate for that. I believe with all my heart that God would do an incredible work if we would would be filled with his spirit. That's what Galatians 5 is about, right? Be filled with, be led by the spirit of God. Let, Let me ask you this as we close. How do we enjoy the presence of God? Well, we enjoy the presence of God certainly through prayer as we call on his name. We have this precious privilege, right? He says we can come. We can come anytime, 24-7, boldly to the throne of God. We can open up the word of God and we can hear from him. And I know I get, I probably get accused of, of, of emphasizing the church to a greater degree than maybe I should. But listen, when the people of God gather together, God is, he dwells in that place in a special way. And so we experience the presence of God when we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. When we, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, right, paints a picture of the church of God as the temple of God, where his presence dwells. Yes, each one of us individually have the indwelling of the Spirit, but there's a unique presence when the people of God gather together uh, that we should not forsake. So I guess the question for us is, Are we taking that for granted? The privilege of prayer, the the joy of spending time with him in his word, of fellowshipping with him, with his people? Let's not take it for granted. I believe this. As we enjoy his presence, we experience his protection, we find his direction, and we see God accomplishing incredible things through us as a people. And he gets the glory. And that's what we want. Let's close in prayer tonight. Father, we thank you for this word. Lord, how you speak to us. And uh, Lord, uh, as we come to the end of this journey through the book of Exodus, I pray that you would take the eternal truths of your word and implant them deep in our heart. Help us not to take, uh, take your presence for granted as we gather here tonight among your people. Lord, I ask that you would help us to be a light, uh, to be... Uh, As we leave this place, may your presence be known through us as we go out into the world. May we spend time with you in prayer and in your word. And Lord, may you be glorified in your church. Uh, Lord, you know the needs. Perhaps there are some who are listening tonight. Uh, 
on the uh, internet. And Lord, I, I pray that you might just draw them to yourself. That they might see their need and trust in Christ and experience this fellowship with you. Uh, this glorious presence of God. We ask these things in Jesus' name.